cool. So, um, so we'll get started here for those that uh, that weren't on the session with uh, Udi Wedegor from the the CMO of Gong. We had a great session. I'm uh, I'm still feeling really uh, fired up after it. He's create like you should listen to it afterwards a ton of great ideas how to think differently how to not follow best practices of where i'm going to start how to actually he talked about avoiding best practices um for the reason that if they're best practices people have been doing that stuff for a very long time and it be, it's actually the it's a it's not it's not best practice it's original like uh, not authentic and so um so i think that's somewhere to start because People love to follow. There's messages all over the place coming in from the Facebook ad rep, from the Google ads recommendations, from the blog you read about SEO, from the person talking about going to do ABM. There is there is messages everywhere about what the best practices are. But when you truly reach a point, and he had mentioned this, and I feel like I'm there as well, You'll truly reach a point as a marketer where you don't listen to that stuff anymore because you learn by doing it because you are so far ahead of other people. Yes, you get ideas from people. Yes, you see things in the wild, but in order to discover it for yourself, you actually do it yourself. Um, and so that that's really interesting. I get I get sent benchmarks from people all the time. Got some today on LinkedIn. You should have 60% go to brand and 40% go to performance. And I'm like, why who set those benchmarks i'm here to write the benchmarks i'll i'll decide what they are you know what i mean and so like by by testing and doing you figure out maybe it's maybe it's 80 20 maybe it's 100 percent zero just because someone else tells you what it is doesn't mean that it's right and so including me right like you all will get to a place where you think that some of the stuff that i say is wrong and that's awesome so i just want to push people to doing that because i uh, i see it a lot from people converging on what is quote unquote best practices, which ends up being that you don't stand out because you're doing all the same stuff that everyone else is doing. Um, and Gong's a great example. I'll go through a couple of things they did. They we went through the Super Bowl, but they also they also like wrapped up uh, robots that deliver food, like in Uber Eats or something. And so imagine being like the CMO of a company and getting your pizza delivered by a robot that's wrapped in the brand that's trying to get to you. How subtle and like thought, it just, it's really creative. Um, what are some of the other things they said, Megan? They, um, they did, they wrapped cars. So instead of, oh, this is a good one for people. Instead of spending a hundred thousand dollars or more on a Dreamforce booth, they wrapped cars with gong Uber cars and then had them drive around. So they got all of the brand impressions. Um, which is interesting. I've heard people that go to conferences and just set up meetings. Like, I think that's the easiest way to do a conference is go to Dreamforce, forget the booth, set up all the meetings, do all the stuff that you need to do, create content, do sales meetings, network, go to the sessions. Like, um, so I think there's alternatives there that wouldn't follow quote unquote B2B best practices. Now, now that we got through all of that, let's get to the, the agenda. But I thought that was cool to kind of like get going on. So I'm going to go out of order like I normally do. Um, and so I'm going to start with why B2B companies struggle with organic content that's not for SEO. And why, so what, maybe we should start with why do companies, uh, why are, why do companies tend to do okay with SEO? Because at this point it's robotic, right? Like, you know, the things to do and it doesn't, you know, get the keywords, do this, optimize the page, build the backlinks, do all the stuff. Like you, it's pretty much a cookie cutter formula to get someone to search for you to show up and for you to get somewhere now. And then the content, someone has an intent, as long as the content matches that intent, it's good. Not to say that the SEO matches the intent of the search and they buy something, but they just get the traffic and that's how they measure it. But when you move outside of SEO, there's a lot of other, I'm talking social mainly, but you know, podcast, an overall event, um, content on any social platform, a community potentially where content gets put in, all those different places, people have options, right? There is, there's no intent in those channels, right? So they have options to do a lot of things, right? On LinkedIn, you, you're, you could be doing, you could be looking at a bunch of people that post. I don't know how many people are. I'm guessing there's probably like th a million to 3 million people that post on LinkedIn. You have a lot of options. Right. And so why should someone go out of their way to take time out of their day to consume your content? 
And so in awareness channels, people have options is something to think about. Unlike an intent channel like SEO, where they need something and then you give it to them. In awareness channels, you actually have to be interested enough to capture their attention. Um, the next one sort of goes in the same vein is, is that um, you have to have a deep understanding of customers. I talk about this all the time. I keep pounding it because I keep interacting with marketers at every level that don't spend enough time with their customers. And if you spent enough time with your customers, you would understand them better and you would be able to write things that they actually want, not the things that you wish they wanted. And so, and then the last one is that it requires a completely different mindset and a completely different mind frame than using intent channels like SEO. Completely different mind frame in an organic social channel to consistently do that and not have certain things like website traffic or attribution or tracking in order to keep on that path. And so, um, and the last thing is if you think about it deeply, you can, uh, a lot of companies outsource SEO to an agency. Like I said before, it's, you can cookie cutter, put it together um, based on data and then do it and then write it and then formulaic and then post it and then wait for it to rank. Um, and then they try and take the same thing a lot of companies do this. A lot of companies struggle. We, we specifically try our best not to work with companies that do this is they try to have somebody else create the content for them because they're not committed to doing it. And they think that it's formulaic like SEO. And what will happen at that point is it's going to fall on its face because there's not, unless you have some type of subject matter expert that really knows their stuff, which a lot of the people writing the content aren't, it's going to be really hard for your content to break through in these channels when it's outsourced to somebody else because of a volume requirement, volume requirement and consistency requirement to be successful, a, a customer understanding the idea of when you put in content that you need to get the feedback, you have to be in there. I'm in there every day looking at what people are commenting, who's doing it, what are they saying, how's it going? How does it track within the first hour? What do the metrics feel like? You have to be in there to feel those things, which then gives you a feedback loop into your content to go and produce another piece. And so people aren't in the details enough to get that stuff. I find it really fascinating over time how much insights I get by posting and then listening. And a lot of people, like the people that want to outsource their content, the person that's producing the content is not the person distributing it and they're not listening to those things. And so those are some tips. You could, you could literally just take the exact reverse of that and do those things and you would be successful. And if you took the reverse of that and you're like, okay, I want to do it, it would put in your mind that you need to do this in-house. And so I'm trying to encourage companies as, as best I can, as loud as I can. And I've done, I did it six months ago and now I'm coming back now is that in order to be truly successful for content marketing outside of SEO, I, I truly believe that you need to do it in-house and you need to have a level of commitment where you have the talent and the resources and things like that in order to do it. And so a lot of people want to check the box and say that they're doing it. And there's a difference between doing something and then doing something that's effective. Go ahead, Megan. It looks like you want to jump in. Go, go. There's a, well, George submitted a couple comments on this topic beforehand. And then Katie, I saw your, your comment in here, which I think it could be fun to bring you on for a minute, just to like sort of push on this topic a little more. Yeah, George, I love that. Was, George was essentially asserting that, that it, although it's difficult, like you can write content that is compelling for customers and also really good for SEO. Like he was basically saying, there's sort of not a choice. You can do both. You know, it is difficult. It's challenging. Not a lot of people are good at that. Um, but curious, do you, you agree? You disagree with that? Um, and then I'm going to bring Katie on next. Cause I want her to, to her to express this point, but what do you have to say George, to, to George? George, I know that you specifically are awesome and could do it. And I personally <laughs> believe that I could, if I did it, but if you look at the majority of stuff, 99% I don't think is going to work. It takes a very special person. And I just don't think there's a lot of people out there. And I think um, a lot of the people that are, that are using agencies, the person that's the one actually creating it is not the person like, like you, uh, but point well taken there. There are clear people out there for sure. Katie, I want to bring you on. Cause I, I, um, 
I liked your point that you made, and I think it'll be good to kind of have an additional perspective on this topic. I just um, need you. Yeah, thank you. Hey, hey. good to Hi. see you. <laughs> um, so I I totally agree with your point. Um, and the the part that I disagreed with was that SEO is formulaic and that you don't need subject matter expertise for SEO, that it's kind of like a cookie cutter mm -hmm. thing. Um, Google is considering so many topics, mm -hmm. particularly B2B topics as your money or your life now. Um, and in order to rank for your money or your life topics, you have to have subject matter expertise. And if you want to have quality content, you have to have subject matter experts writing that content. Um, and I think- So are so you trying to say that, that using a person who's not a subject matter expert uh, wouldn't work? Yeah, exactly. For SEO specifically. Yeah. I just, like agree. It's companies. like an extension. Yeah. I've been with enough companies to know that the subject, the person who's a real subject matter expert is most often not the one writing that stuff. No, I know. And that's exactly, yeah. I totally agree with you. And I think a lot of content, particularly in the B2B space that's written for SEO is mm -hmm. just like hot trash. Like it's like not, it's, it, it might be performing well if the competition is also producing hot trash, but that's basically the only reason. Like mm -hmm. stuff that's super keyword stuffed and like with crappy links going back to it and all of that kind of thing. So yeah. Um, yeah. And it comes in, it just goes into the idea of the best practices, right? Like that's a, that, that is having outsourcing your content to stuff keywords to write SEO is a current B2B best practice. Right. Which is like um, stupid, <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, straight yeah. up about it I mean because the return on investment then is like because you're like shoving CTRs into content that doesn't even match it like it just it I think it sends you down a road of like like your your blog becoming like a graveyard of like something that people don't care about as opposed to using it effectively to you know build an audience and a brand yeah and yeah. to I'll, I'll be like really honest with some some thoughts that we have right now, like in terms of our best practices for certain accounts, we're thinking about pulling out of Google ads. Yeah. In, you know, hundred dollar cost per clicks, low conversion rates, non-branded search, waste of money. Yeah. Right. Like you can go and take that 10 or 15 or $20,000 and go make that work way harder doing something else. And so that's something that we have on the radar for certain types. There are certain industries, event management software, there's a million of them out there where it's a typically a non-branded search because nobody's winning on brand in that space. Right. And so in that, and there's a lot of searches for that. And so there are places where you can win, but for a lot of other companies, it's, it's just a money pit. And every other competitor is doing the same thing and they've raised more money than you and they're spending, they're wasting a ton of money in order to hit that spot. And I've seen enough of the data and the companies that do that to know that it's not positive. Right. And like, and you can't, a lot of the time you can't repurpose SEO content for other Definitely not. Like I think that's Google a big, mis like big that. mistake yeah. that big mistake that companies make is thinking that you take SEO content and post it on Twitter or LinkedIn and think that it's going to work. Right. Right. <laughs> like, um, nope. So yeah, that's something that we run into too. You actually need two entirely different strategies for those two different distribution channels. Yep. Thanks, yeah. Katie. Cool. Appreciate that was great. You sharing your thoughts. Yeah. Well, and um, David had some good questions on the positioning topic. So this might be a good segue into the second agenda topic, the lost art of segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Yeah. Um, share some thoughts and then we can um, bring David on to ask his question. Yeah. So um, on this one, it's been, it's been top of mind for me recently. Um, mainly because as we do it as a company, I recognize how much better it works in, in terms of the overall company strategy, right? Like I'm a marketing strategist and I also drive company strategy, which is something that happens in a lot of companies, just not tech SaaS, right? And so it, we talked about that and how the roles are split up and different things like that, but you need a cohesive a cohesive, a strategy and approach, which includes alignment on true segmentation, how do you segment? If, if people saw my post today, how we segment, go to market strategy, what they're selling, whether it's a product or a service, how much the product or service costs, what those people inside of the company think, how they do things, what type of tech they use, right? And so, but the psychographics 
to be honest with you, the firmographics are black and white. Every company out there is like, we only want to sell the companies that are more than 200 employees and this and this and this. They all use company firmographics. The psychographics are really interesting as we get through because we know people that believe in the things that we're doing become customers. People that are looking for a media agency to push buttons do not become customers. And so the first thing that I vet on a discovery call is whether or not they believe in what we're doing. And if they don't, then I'm not spending any more time on it because it's a losing game. And so for us, I've noticed it. I've had, I'll tell a story about in my, in my past, some different things that I've done. Um, and I just don't see it happening enough uh, at, the, at the business level and at the marketing team level inside of uh, specifically tech SaaS. And so I'll give you two examples. Um, at one point back in the day, we were selling into hospitals. We sold to respiratory therapists uh, and emergency medicine physicians and medical directors and, you know, NICU nurses and pediatric intensive care nurses. And there's a million different parts of hospitals and inside of hospitals, there's a lot of other tiers. There's post-acute care, there's acute care, there's level one trauma, right? And then if you go into just a NICU, there's level one NICU, level two NICU, level three NICU. There's plenty of different quote unquote, firmographic segmentations inside of in, inside of those places. So how do you decide where to go? Like as a company, how do you get aligned on what is your best? What, what is, where's the place where you're going to win? We're going to have the highest value. We're going to be able to get into certain accounts and be able to expand those accounts and their, their high value accounts, right? So what a B2B tech SaaS company would do is they say, they're going to go to the top 50 accounts with the most beds. And then they're going to try and push through on those, on those top 50 regard. And then they're going to go through at every angle. They're going to try the ICU. They're going to try the NICU. They're going to try this. They're going to try this. They're going to do this. What we did is we had two ways in. Um, one was in neonatal. And so we were very clear that our value prop inside of that resonated well, and we were going to win there. We had a, we had an unfair competitive advantage there. And then the other place that we went for was the emergency department, because when someone comes in and they get on this thing and then they get admitted to the hospital and they go to the ICU, the machine goes with them. And so they go, they get on the machine in the ER and then they go to the ICU and then they go up to the ICU. So the ICU needs to use that machine too. And then they step down to medical surgical. So the machine goes there. And so just by following the patient, you penetrate three or four departments inside of a hospital by picking the right one in the first place. Um, and so that's, that's one example, but just like different types of, of entry points inside of a hospital. But the key is finding out where you have a unfair competitive advantage, where your product is differentiated, where there's an opening in the market, where there's something where you can get in easily, right? And so that's, that's one different thing. I'll give you another example. I think I've mentioned this a couple of times, but in, uh, I'll do it briefly. Another company I worked for is sold to the senior living industry. We work with we work with several other companies that are targeting senior living. And this experience from me now helps the companies that we work for on this one. Inside of senior living, there are three main ways to segment. It's independent living, assisted living, and then memory care or people for people with, that are dealing with dementia. Those three different places. Independent living is the largest segment by far. And they also have the most money. And so if you were selling to senior living, it would make sense that you target that segment. But we had a product that if you went and talked, the real results happened for people with dementia. And so if you're going to a put in, into a segment, trying to sell to the largest total addressable market segment, where the people are in that place for a reason because they don't have dementia, and you're trying to sell your product that fits for dementia products, you're not going to have a lot of success. But if you just think about it as senior living as an industry overall, and plenty of companies are like, we want to sell to financial services. Why? Because they ran out of runway on tech SaaS and financial services has a lot of money. And so um, I think that it's a lost art. Now, the way that you figured, the way that I figured these things out and the way that I figured out how to segment is you need to do market research. Like I found out that the product was best used for dementia people by visiting five of them and seeing how they used the product and seeing what the patient thought about it and seeing what those people thought about it and then visiting the other people that we were targeting and seeing the exact opposite. 
And so by being able to do to do true market research, where you are curious, where you are looking to learn, where you're taking qualitative information and then building hypotheses off of that is incredibly, it's something that I've been doing for my whole career. I think it gives me a, a huge advantage about, uh, against people that don't understand these sound principles because then you take that information and then it drives messaging. Who knows, we might've been able to charge more for dementia because the product actually fit there. It could have driven pricing up. So messaging, pricing, positioning, and then your overall go-to-market strategy. Maybe people that were in the dementia facilities wanted uh, on-site implementation not us sending it in a box, right? Who knows what those things are, but it can, it can drive your entire strategy just by picking the segment right. And the key is by picking the segment that you have an unfair competitive advantage. I think that's the way that I look at it. And I think a lot of companies miss that because they're trying to go for everyone. And there's a huge value in not going after everyone. Being specific is a huge, huge value driver. And there's a thing that happens when you are very narrow is that when you are very narrow, you get in quickly, your business grows, and then you expand. Whether it's expanding segments or expanding products to serve the segment that you chose in the first place versus trying to go after everyone and growing slowly. So um, David, I'm sure you have some questions. I'm, I'm fascinated to talk about this, but that's where I'll get it started. David, uh, I'm gonna bring you on. Oh, you're on, good. Okay, so He's in. Thank you. This is a great topic, right? So I definitely believe in targeting. The more you can target, the more specific your message can be, the more specific your message can be, the better you can resonate with your, your reader or listener or your mm -hmm. audience, right? Um, for a lot of demand gen people, however, they don't get to pick the target, right? That, that definition is perhaps negotiated between the sales teams and the product teams, especially in the larger organizations. Yeah, and in my view, they, laughable, by the way. Uh, uh, well... So what I was going to say is, if you can't be at the table when the conversations take place, because it, in your company, that's not something that they're allowing, right? Mm -hmm. You can be at the table to provide results. Here's how this message resonated. Here's how this target is, seems to be responding. And um, when I've done that with my product marketing teams, when I was kind of more, more junior, they, they were very hungry for that information because they came up with their targeting and their messaging um, based on their conversations, based on their version of the market research motion that Chris just talked about, right? Mm -hmm. Interviewing customers, talking to prospects and, and talking with engineers and trying to put together the best message. That being said, they would write out what you might call a, a message platform. And mm -hmm. we in demand gen would receive that and weren't supposed to play with the wording too much because they didn't trust us, right? So we could get the results back. Was this a topic that people resonated with? We could tell by the clicks and or the registrations or whatever it was that we were measuring. And we could see that certain segments, certain um, different portions of the overall addressable market might be responding better to certain messages. And if you, if you have an opportunity and you, and you can, sharing that back with the product team is very helpful for them because it gives them calibration information. It's not so much that they got it wrong or that they want it their way or the highway kind of thing. If, if that's the approach, that's always a, a downside and, and you know we hate that, right? But if you can kind of go back and say, this is what we're getting back from the market on this messaging. Let me put this into your kit bag. I think maybe we could do better, but that's not my job, right? That's yours. Mm -hmm. But if I keep using this messaging, it's much more expensive than this other messaging. I'd rather spend the money there because it, I get twice the response. Mm -hmm. Obviously I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying the story. So if you can't actually create the messaging that you would like to use, uh, work directly with sales to create the targeted um, teams that you want to work with, at least provide the feedback to those teams that are, and then you can have an influence over the overall picture. Just a thought. Yeah. And to be, to be clear, we don't have control over our customers ICP, right? So we're in that seat right now. We just try hard to work for companies that have clear product market fit and traction and a lot of companies that need, that need it. Right. And so that's sort of a lens that we look at it in. Um, because without product market fit, there's no sense in doing marketing. You're just going to spin your wheels. You got to go back. You got to go back to the drawing board. You got to talk to customers. You got to get, you got to find your segment. Right. Um, so I think the key, um, to start with is, is in product market fit and people are doing this, right. It doesn't matter in titles, whether it's sales, whether it's product, whether it's marketing, whether it's finance, like somebody, I hope 
is going out and talking to customers and figuring out these types of details. What I fear, especially on the early stage companies, is that um, the founder doesn't do any selling, so doesn't get any feedback, which then drives unrealistic goals on either marketing or sales because they don't understand it. I talked with Udi today, the CEO of Gong sold their first 50 customers and then hired Udi and then a year later hired a head of sales, which I think is a really interesting progression for companies to think. I know Megan would say customer success leader, but I think it's a really interesting progression because I've heard that by from multiple sales leaders and multiple successful marketing leaders or CEOs that the new order here that in 2010 was get four customers, raise money and build a sales team is now the, the CEO sells deals, get a marketer and then build your sales team once you have product market fit and established demand engine, which is interesting. Cool. They need to bypass the customer support leader as long as whether it was the head of marketing or head of sales is doing the things that the CS leader okay. would do. Thanks for clarifying. <laughs> um, no, I thought that's the decision I would still make that. <laughs> that. Cool. Let's talk about momentum and then we'll get into q and I'm sure Charlie's got some yeah. good questions for us, but this is something that I'm like, I'm, to be honest, we, we continue to figure it out, right? Like, the, uh, it's interesting when you think about it, like, I don't have all the, the answers, I have the answers that I have right now, and then we're going to keep moving and growing. So one of the things that we're noticing is on the momentum side, both with our business and for customers that have been with us for more than a year. Um, and so what we're finding is when you properly execute like demand, content, brand, performance, whatever you wanna look at it as, when you properly execute that over time, more people at least know about you and know about what your product does and have an affinity to you. And maybe right now there's a lot of companies out there, maybe they're listening to this where they're like, we don't need to work with Refine Labs. But they're going to be the first one that we think that they think of when they do need someone like us. And so that's where you build momentum because you keep stacking top of mind, being top of mind for potential buyers over and over and over while you're also getting pipeline and customers. And so you have this momentum system. It's kind of like, it's a different way to look at HubSpot's like flywheel, right? Because you're doing stuff, you're building pipeline, you're getting customers. Ideally, those customers are feeding stuff back into the market, but you're also doing a lot of marketing. So you become top of mind. So when those people need something, it might not be direct response. You might not be retargeting or cooking them or sending them a display ad. But one day they just think, hey, it's time to buy whatever that software tool is. And the probability of more and more people in the market doing that over time, because more and more people know about you, um, is really fascinating. You can get that. You can get that done through proper execution of paid. You can get that done through proper, um, proper organic mar marketing and a ton of different channels. So there's there's a lot of ways to get that done, but it's really interesting to to see that play out now. And as you start to build momentum, if you have something running and you have something going well. Like for instance, our LinkedIn cadence, right? Like my LinkedIn cadence has been running. I don't even know how long now. It's probably, probably close to two years, believe it or not. So that LinkedIn cadence has been running for two years, right? And that's delivering something. And then we stack something on top of it once that's going. And then we stack something on top of it. And then we stack something on top of it. And so it's really, for, for whatever reason, people want to like, make changes in channels to try and optimize stuff rather than just doing that channel well and then figuring out new executions to add into the mix. And so um, that one has been interesting to watch, right? Like there was a there was a while back ago and we've like we've added layers and we've been building pure brands. Like all we're doing in all of our marketing, there's zero performance, there's zero CTAs, there's zero direct response. We're not running ads to get MQLs. Right. But there was a time not too long ago where we would get, I would get two meetings on my calendar for discovery calls a week. And I think we got nine today. That's what momentum is. And so you, you can't manu, you can't manufacture that. You can't manufacture the amount of people that want to come to you and actually buy stuff. You have to, you have to build it. You're on, you're on mute. It's the first time I've ever had to tell you that, by the way. 
Um, the uh, everyone thinks that it doesn't take as much time as it does. I think that's like the key to it. You just said you're probably hitting your two year anniversary posting on LinkedIn and, you know, we surpassed the 100th podcast episode. Like it just took a ton of time. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the momentum takes time. Yeah, I agree. All right, people, let's open it up. Let's do some, let's do some Q and a Charlie, what type of MQL stacking are you doing this? this week. I know we don't have a, a Charlie question yet. We made him cry talking about product market fit. Uh. <laughs> I'm just teasing you, Charlie. Think of a question though. We have a couple submitted from before that we can knock out and then guys drop your questions in the chat and we'll bring you on right after. So yeah. Klaus was actually at the Udi event a couple hours ago and said he couldn't make it tonight. Uh, Love the event though, and wanted to see if we could cover this question. I definitely have some thoughts and I know you will too. So um, this is what he said. Uh, Let's suppose we have this valuable customer feedback that can be used for product improvement. However, we struggle to convince the product development team to consider this since the roadmap has been fixed or planned for an extended period of time and and they don't want to change it. How would you convince product management to take a different approach, revisit their planned roadmap? How do we make them acknowledge uh, the value of the customer feedback that they're collecting and be more flexible and agile when it comes to product development? He's asking for some thoughts on that. I can jump in because uh, I... I got a lot on this one. <laughs> Go, you start. <laughs> yeah, I got I got some... So I've been on both sides of this. Yeah. I've been as the product manager where people are like mainly sales is like, we need to build this. And I've been the marketer that doesn't own products saying... We need, we're getting locked out of deals at our top accounts because this feature isn't in here. Can you build this now? Right. And so I've been on both sides of this. So I have, I think I have a unique perspective. Um, the first step when doing this is just because a customer tells you that that was the reason that they didn't buy it does not mean that it's true. Okay. So a lot of salespeople take direct feedback from customers and feed that into the product. And it is the wrong approach. And so when you get feedback, you need to qualitatively assess it. You need to assess about why did they say they, they, they prevent, they're presenting you with a solution to the problem that they think that they need. You need to reverse engineer what the problem is and then figure out whether their solution is the right solution to that problem or there's a different one that you can do. That is a huge point. Taking customer feedback about why you lost deals or requests directly is not always a good strategy. I would say that often it's not. It's you need to understand what they actually, it's not what they say, it's what you, that they actually need. You, need. you need to interpret that. So once you figure out what they actually need, you need to go, if you believe in it so much, you need to go out in the market and figure out what the market opportunity is. So you need to go and talk to people. So talk to people, I would figure it out. I would, I would whether it's recorded calls, whether it's documented notes, whether it's I talked to these 10 people that aren't customers and they said X, Y, and Z, and I'm coming back now. So you need to talk to people and figure out if there's actually an opportunity here and work on your messaging and your pitch. Okay. That's step one. Step two, once you have that data and you feel like it's real, you got to build a business case. Marketers need to figure out how to do this. So you got to build a business case against it. If we build this feature, we're going to, you know, we're going to win 5% more deals in this segment, which is going to lead to this amount of first year revenue and in the future expansion revenue and building this thing for hundred grand is going to pay us off in two and a half million dollars over this period of time. And if we want to, if we don't have the resources to do it in-house, here are five people that could do it. So that's an answer. Another one to think about is if you did that stuff, So you went out and talked to people, you had the business case. What I found specifically with executives is that you need to show them. And so I have brought CEOs of companies to a customer to show them what's happening about why we should target this segment versus the one that they think that they're going after or why we're getting locked out of deals because our machine leaks because we don't have this part installed in it when they're trying to use it this way or whatever it is. And sometimes they just need to see it for themselves. And so those are, those are some opportunities. Figure out, what the, figure out what the real problem is, not what the, the solution that they told you is, and then try and build a solution that's built for their problem. Build a, go and do qualitative market research and understand what the, what the potential opportunity is. Oftentimes, you're going to go through step one and step two and figure out that there's no opportunity. And that's the right answer, too. 
there's no right or wrong answer to this. It's just what it is. And so if you go down a path and you think this is going to be a good product and 10 people say this product is going to suck, I don't want it, then you got your answer. A no is good too, because you just would have wasted a lot of time and money building something that people don't want. And then if it, if it works out, build a business case. And if you need to show the people that actually make the decisions and put it, put them in an environment where they see it in real life with a customer. You hit on all the points I would have made. I think um, a product leader that I worked with that I really liked when you think about timeframes also had this rule of thumb, like three, six, 12. So you need to have a vision of what you want your product to be at 12 months, but that should be a very high level vision because there's a lot of ways to get there, but that will anchor people on what you're trying to do. You should have a milestone at six months that makes you feel like you'll get there. And then you should have a detailed roadmap of about three months, um, but not actually plan too much farther than that. I don't know how long Kloss's company's roadmap is, is planned yeah. out, but he touched on that. And that was an interesting way to think about how detailed you should get in your planning um, while still having sort of a longer term North Star to work towards. Yeah, it's crazy for me, for some of the industries that I came from, for people to know that sometimes when you decide in medical device, when you, the day that you decide to build a product, it is three to seven years before that product becomes launched. You have to actually build it. You need to go through regulatories. You have to do clinical trials. You need to get the FDA to approve it. You need to roll out a beta and then you actually start selling it. And so it's in, it, where I came from, you're making big bets. This is not like, you know, we're going to write this line of code and push it out tomorrow. And so that's, it's sort of maybe my brain and marketing strategy, because when you make those decisions from a marketing standpoint, marketing and product marketing, do those activities, then you, you got to do a lot of work to know that you're right. Totally. I think, yeah, like at a B2B SaaS company, SaaS it's, different. Company, it's a little bit different, but yeah, you're, I mean, you're right. And I'm sure that would apply to other, other types of companies too. For that. All right. Um, Patrick had a couple of questions. He couldn't make it, but was really hoping he said he'll listen after. Um, so we actually had two different questions. I'll go ahead and ask you his first one. Are you making any adjustments for your clients based on Google phasing out broad and modified keywords and pushing people towards phrase match? Specific Google question. So... I'll be honest with you, I don't know the deep intricacies of this, but when we run single keyword ad groups, we typically run broad modified and phrase. And then if we don't need the broad modified, we shut it off. And what happened was they just consolidated those two keyword groups into one, which is phrase match with just more, uh, with more liberties on the Google side to decide how to match it up. And so um, what we're going to do is we're probably not going to use broad modified anymore because it's there and we're going to use phrase match. And so to be honest, not a lot of, uh, I don't expect a lot of changes on our side from a mechanic standpoint, we don't go broad match and we don't do, um, and when we do bid broad modified, it's with a high intent modifier, like software pricing, like the volumes are low. And so mm, I don't see a lot of changes on our side. And then just a note for people as well. Like we started to base Gatano and I talked about it maybe in October or something, or maybe it was recently, I'm not sure, but like we've made a pretty hard move away from exact match um, because it's restrictive. The CPCs are higher and honestly, like it on it, phrase match works just as good. So um, we've moved to like our, that's our Google ad strategy. But the, the key is that, yeah, you can tweak the buttons inside of Google ads. You can change your bid strategy. You can do all those things that you want, but if your overall strategy on targeting high intent terms and putting them in the right place is not in there, then it doesn't matter what your bid is. Like, so there's a, there's a strategic level that most people are missing on Google ads and then they over-engineer the tactical. All right, I think I know how you're gonna answer this next question from Patrick, but I wanna ask it because he'll listen to it. Um, and I'll put another call out guys. We have a couple more questions, but I wanna bring some of you on. So yeah, drop, yeah. drop something in. So second question from Patrick Nelson. How do you feel about incentives like gift cards to push demos? Um, in this case, is it keeping CAC at acceptable levels? Um, or at, in this case, it is keeping CAC at acceptable levels. And there's a nicely defined ICP. Have you seen this model or a variation of it that works well? The only place where I've seen this model work 
is if you're selling to marketers or salespeople. And the CAC is still pretty high. And so um, I know that you're including the gift card. I imagine that you're running LinkedIn conversation ads or another form of ad to get in there. And that's how you're quantifying CAC. But I doubt that what's being quantified is the 100 hours that an SDR spends chasing all the people that aren't, aren't there, the, the margin created for the AE, the, um, all of the AE's time that's put into the demos that don't win. So anyway, regardless of the CAC calculation, like I've seen a lot of companies try this, selling 100K deals, and they're like, we'll just do this. But those, the people that are doing this are often incentivized to drive demos not revenue, which is why they do it. And there's plenty of people, inclu probably including me at some point, that would show up and sit on a demo for 30 minutes for 200 bucks. I don't know. I would have to, I would have to be pretty interested in order to do that. And if I was pretty interested in order to do it, I would just do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? They wouldn't have to send me a conversation ad to do it. I would just, if I wanted it, I would just go there and ask for a demo and buy it and they wouldn't have to give me the money. Um, and so I've seen a lot of companies miss on this. Um, and what happens when, when you miss on this is that you run the conversation ads, you give a lot of gift cards away and you lose credibility with your sales team because none of the people have buying intent and they hate wasting their time on that stuff. And so, um, can it work? Yeah, I've seen it work. Could it work in your industry? You should try it and, and figure it out, but it's like the, um, the gimmick stuff is not something that I like to do. I like to earn the revenue. I don't need, I don't need gimmicks. And so it's not something that I, I, I do a lot. Um, and I've, I've seen enough Salesforce instances of people that try it and it's getting even more crowded. And so mm, I'm generally not a fan of the tactic. Better use of the gift cards could be setting up customer interviews for market research, a customer or interviews, product I mean, reviews. <laughs> If anyone's seen the very thoughtful, like I believe, truly believe that gift cards, gifting, blah, 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 is way better utilized on the customer side than on the prospect side. I'm watching people that send their customers a very thoughtful, nice gift. And then that customer, because it was personalized and thoughtful and they know you and they like you and you don't have intent to expand them or sell them something, you're just doing it because you want to be nice that they like it, they have more affinity to you and increases retention rate. They post it on social media. A lot of people see it, more people have awareness to you. And so I like using gifting in that. If I was going to do gifting, I would use it in that. And we do it at Refine Labs. We did a bunch of it over um, Q4 and we'll continue to do it, um, is, is gifting on the customer side. But companies, companies don't do it because they don't see the ROI. And in our, our case, it was really just a surprise and delight an exactly. appreciation that's what, that's... gesture. Yeah, there was no nothing we asked in return for that. Jess asked a really interesting question along the lines of this. Are people going to give skewed responses if they're getting some type of gift or incentive? Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting because I think what I've found is um, even if regardless of whether you're giving a customer a gift or not, if a customer likes you, they will kind of tell you what you want to hear in many cases, and they won't necessarily get super comfortable delivering negative feedback. And so the key for, for that, Jess, is asking questions in a way where it makes it really easy for them to give feedback. So not like, oh, what is wrong? Like, oh, if we could only improve one thing, what could we improve? And just so reframing the questions so that um, they feel like they're being helpful, giving you the constructive feedback or the negative feedback. Um, so I think it's up to the person that's like running the interview or the, the research session to be really thoughtful about how you're framing questions to, to get that out of them. Yep. Setting the environment where someone feels safe to tell you the truth is huge. Like it, I've practiced it a lot. I've gotten better at it. And like the easiest way is like, um, we're here together. I'm trying to figure out how to build this. That's right for you. If like, if there's something that you don't like, it would be awesome if you just told me whatever that qualifier is that you need to make people feel safe, I think is really important. Um, and then the key on this one, and I see a lot of people fall down and I fell down on it early in my career, is that a lot of people tend to ask questions that are leading questions to lead people to the answer that you want, um, which is not the point of this activity. And so just be careful because even I t sometimes get into it, which is like, um, 
you just lead people to an answer? Would you like the, would you like it if you like lead them to a yes? Um, and so those are two, two tips. All right. Well, we got some action in the chat now for some questions. So a uh, bye, Matthew, Bob, I'm going to bring you guys all on. Um, people are coming out of the woodwork now. Yeah. I just, like you know, it. takes a minute. That's all. Um, a uh, bye. I'm going to bring you on first and asking you I should be unmuted. Cool. Am I coming through? Yeah. You're I can in. hear you. Cool. What's up crew. Hey, Hey, good to see good you to be back. Good to see you. Um, I have a couple of questions tonight, if that's cool. One is just for like a pulse check on the major themes of content types and campaigns that are still performing for your clients. I've heard you mention three main categories in the past, like a feature benefit piece, a problem solution awareness piece, and then like an in-depth case study with a well-known organization, ideally in whatever industry that you're in, that's kind of ROI focused as being three like major themes of content that seem to work well on you know mm -hmm. paid social ads for driving high intent and requests on the back end of the of the click or or the or the view within a certain time window. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if like if that's still holding steady, like if those content types are still working or if that's expanded at all and, and you've found you know four, five, six, seven, like you know, additional content types that seem to be working in, in a similar way. Yeah, I left a it's sort of off topic, but I left a comment on someone's post that basically like paid an agency 50 grand and got no return. And they told us I read the blog about it and I responded to it, which is you made a couple big mistakes when you did that. One, you spent forty thousand dollars on one video and thought it was going to be a home run and then 10 10 K on media and you swung and missed. And so the reason that we use some of these like I would call lower lift pieces like uh, simple images or s short form written blog posts or different things like that is because it's easy to put out volume to learn so that you don't have to go out and make a huge video and it doesn't hit and miss. And so those are the, we start with customers in that way because it takes a long time. I'm mean, sure you've been through it. It takes a long time to build a rhythm of that type of process where you understand what's going to work in that channel. Now, once customers get more mature, or anyone could do this. Once Pete, someone is more mature, I recommend those steps because it's the easiest way to know whether or not the channel's working. Um, is like then you get creative flexibility inside of the channel. So, um, like I think that if we took my videos from uh, organic and ran them to SaaS CMOs at companies that are fifty to a thousand employees, that it would probably do pretty decent, like literally just taking an organic, organic post about like, Hey, lead gen versus demand gen and just run that in the feed. I think that would do pretty well. So I think there's a thought leadership aspect. As long as the content is good, the easiest way to know whether it's good before you push it on ads is to build an audience organically, validate it organically, and then run into ads to people that are not in your current audience. Um, so that's one, um, cartoons or drawings I've seen work well. Um, so you just have more creative flexibility on the actual graphic instead of just like copy SAS screenshot or, or person, um, animations, I think have been working quite well. And then, and then whether it's live action, like gongs video that we talked about, like they put together a pretty li big live action. Yeah. They bought the Super Bowl media spot, but they got tons of impressions on LinkedIn and YouTube as well to the tune of probably more than a million. Right. And so like that, that video I, I don't know what it cost, right? It was probably a lift. It was probably somewhere between 20 and a hundred grand. I don't know. Um, but that, that video made a huge impact, even if you took out the Super Bowl media spot. Um, and so I think once you have the system running, it's truly about how do you make a lot of stuff? How do you try a lot of things? And how do you know what to look for in the data to know whether or not it worked and get insights? But it, once you have the system running, it's truly uh, creativity after that. Because people, yeah, think, actually... people think that you just get to the static images and then you just run them over and over and it can feel monotonous, even though that's producing $2 million in pipeline every month by doing it. But, and then they think that the channel's maxed out, but you, you know, if you put a really good video in there, or if you put an animation that hit a different way with better messaging that you might get that from two to 2.5 million in pipeline that month. And so people, uh, I run into this a lot where people think that the channel is maxed out, the spend might be maxed out because you can only give so many ads to so many people in one channel when there's a finite amount of people there, but the execution inside of the channel might not be maxed out. Which gets into the second part of my question, um, which is kind of, 
if you if you could describe it, I know it's really hard to do like here on a call like this, but like what your kind of iterative testing process looks like within paid social, like how much budget are you like, how much budget are you putting behind like your initial experiments? Like say you're getting started with a customer and you're not taking anything for granted. You have a good guess about what kind of targeting and what kind of creative and what kind of underlying content is going to work for that customer but you're still validating it, right? You're in the initial maybe few weeks or a couple months of really investing in paid LinkedIn mm -hmm. or paid Facebook for that client. Like what are the things that you're testing? What numbers are you using as kind of guardrails for yourself? Are you trying to hit a certain frequency cap before you make a call on whether that creative and that content is working well? Like, I don't know, just maybe a little bit of, of guidance there um, would, would be helpful. Yeah. So, um, there's basically two different levers here. It's budget and speed, right? And so um, most often the customers that we work with choose speed. And so in order to go faster, we spend knowing that we will be inefficient so that we can learn faster because they have a burn rate and the amount of money spent on media is not even close to the burn, right? And so if we can get that timeline down to learn in six weeks versus six months, then it starts to change the dynamics. So we typically will come out with experiments and the design like always is to drive demand, right? And so we, we learn while we drive demand. So we're getting signals and results and things like that along the way, just knowing that it's inefficient. Um, when we're actually doing it, assuming that they know who they're targeting, right? And assuming that the ICP, and we we'll just talk about a mature business, like at least a, let's say it's a $25 million business, right? So they know who they're going after. They have plenty of customers in that market. They, it's clear data and what type of company size. And so you can get to them. Now, we're going to run those different experiments. The first step is to know on LinkedIn, it's very clear. On Facebook, a lot of companies mess up because you, you are running the ads and the metrics look good, and you're not actually giving the creative to the people that you need to. It happens a lot. Like you, I watch campaigns that are 34 cents cost per click and everyone's pumped. And then you look around and you look at the targeting and it's like interest in Salesforce. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then there's four, four or 5 million people in that audience. And a lot of them would never buy, be able to buy your SaaS tool that you sell the VP of sales. Right. Um, and so Doing this on LinkedIn is probably an easier recommendation for a lot of people because it's clear that who you're going after is a benchmark. Um, and then it's sort of like if we're going to run a message, like a, we're going to market this integration or this feature. And then inside of that, there's going to be different forms of messaging. And then we're going to run that as probably six total variations, uh, three creative variations and two headline variations in the same copy at the top and then we're going to run those and then you'll just watch one bubble to the top usually it's one two three and then over amount of impressions you'll hit a place where there's a couple that the the results on linkedin are not that meaningfully different so they'll sort of converge on an average where it's not statistically relevant um and then we'll always we typically shut off ads around two two and a half frequency cap unless they continue to drive demos and so we're looking at click through rate we're looking at cost per click we're looking at cpm but in the end it's did that ad influence a demo? And so that becomes the ultimate success metric. It's really interesting when you have high spends in those campaigns going on and you market one feature and you market another feature and one feature drove seven demos and the other one drove one and you spent the same amount of money. Um, that's good. That's good feedback. So that's sort of uh, the process, but we'll be ha happy to answer a follow-up because I kind of stayed high level there. Even that high level is, is super helpful. Um... I guess kind of like getting into my situation a little bit more. I'm, I'm um, now kind of managing our Facebook and LinkedIn campaigns directly. And so I'm just nice. trying to do this process better than we have done in the past. In the past, we, we kind of ramped spend uh, too early, in my opinion. We didn't have our framework for experimentation set up properly. So we didn't really know what signals to look for. We were doing MQL hamster wheel style stuff. Mm -hmm. That was the stuff that had clear cost per lead numbers, which we would like extrapolate to be a certain conversion rate into MQOs, yep. into SQOs, into blah, blah, blah. That didn't pan out as, as we have all learned um, Never from does. experience in some ways. And so now I'm just, I'm trying to spend more intentionally and know what kind of signals to look for. And so this kind of high level overview is helpful in terms of like creative variations and frequency cap um, and what, what things you're optimizing for and, you know, mm -hmm. turning on the winning variations and turning off the, the winning variations. 
Mm-hmm. Once all six so variations- another another way to sort of like uh, to uh, I don't know if that would work. I was gonna I was gonna suggest if you wanted to f- sort of figure out on the creative side, you could be more a little bit more aggressive in like the direct response, knowing that the conversion rates are gonna be lower when they fill that out. But direct response to a landing page to conversion. Um, but there's, I think there's too many variables to draw. As I've said that, I think there's too many variables to draw signals, but you might be able to learn from that. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, sorry, last question. I don't want to dominate the time is that once you've gone, you know, you've used all six variations, creative variations for an underlying content piece, one or two have been the winners. Those have like, you've continued to spend on, but that starts to tail off. It will kind of revisiting that underlying content piece and just doing a new set of creative if you still think that that feature that you're promoting or that case that you're promoting still has legs? So um, let me try and explain how I've looked at this before when I was like truly architecting, like people will call it demand generation, but I call it comms, right? Like it is like all around, how do we communicate with our customers to pull, to make them aware of what we're doing and pull them in. And so um, when I would do it, I went out and did research. I understood what objections people had and what, you know, what the gaps were and the knowledge from people that used the product versus didn't. And then I started to build a narrative of the things that people needed to know. And so my communication was strategic. I knew that there was a big objection about this thing. And I ran a piece that addressed that objection with data. Right. And so think if you think about it more like that, like it's not necessarily that like we want to go back into this specific study and highlight a different stat. It's that we accomplished our goal that people understand that there's that stat that indicates that this is a problem. And now we need to go over and educate them on this thing. So if you if you you can build it more strategically where the the insights help, but it's more so um through customer understanding, like you're just communicating the things that they need to know. And yes, like if there's a specific feature that's crushing and driving demos, like we're going to dive into it in a different way the following month. You know what I mean? So I think it's a blend. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you. Bye. Thank you for the questions. All right, Bob, I'm bringing you on. Bob and Uma have collaborated on an ABM question. Bob is going to represent. <laughs> yeah, I think you'd be better off to bring Uma in. Uh, her, her question is much more interesting. But so I think I've tripped into the situation that Udi was talking about on your earlier podcast, which was, you know, I, I joined this company. Um, the CEO initially had sold a number of deals into a national retail space uh, or regional retail space. And I was brought in tasked with hitting more of the private market, right? Mm-hmm. And so started initially you know, hitting my Rolodex and immediately decided I had to execute your strategy for paid social. And so I've been doing that for the past six months or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, the challenge here is, you know, we still have a very undefined sales process. I, I really only have a, a small part-time team kind of doing even any sort of outbound. Mm-hmm. Myself, my own outbound efforts have been limited. Um, so I don't even see hiring salespeople right now as the right move to, mm-hmm. to expand. I'm not sure it's scalable. So what I'm looking at is I'm saying even this market that I'm trying to target, I'm not really convinced that we have fully product market fit. We have a handful of customers in that segment. Mm -hmm. So I'm continuing to do the outbound, you know, um, paid social strategy and tried a couple different things like YouTube and LinkedIn. And, And so what I'm considering is there's a handful, there's about 50 key accounts that are within this national retail, um, you know, regional retail space that we could also go after. The question I have, I, I've heard people talk about ABM and when I hear it, it sounds to me like just key account sales, pick up the phone and try to penetrate these accounts. Is there any sort of marketing effort I should be deploying to try to target these larger regional, you know, these are billion dollar companies and you know, hundreds and hundreds of locations. So the question is how do you penetrate those from a marketing perspective? And then Uma can, as a follow-up, Uma has a much more in-depth specific question that maybe you could pull her up and answer. How much are these accounts worth to you? I mean, you know, each account could be 50,000 annual and okay. you know, upfront, you know, our margin may be 10 or so on the upfront costs. Got it. Yeah. So like you're on the edge about whether or not like a true ABM strategy even makes sense at that price point. Like I typically would look at like, 
100, maybe even 150K now plus deals where there's like a true ABM strategy. So just something to consider. Um, but you can still do it. You're doing a lot of the stuff already and you just need to, you need to match it with the accounts. You need to think about who were the different people inside of those accounts. Maybe you want to give a different message to the VP of ops than you would for the CMO. I don't know who you're going after, but maybe you want to have different messages to those people. So you can have a campaign ABM target list inside of LinkedIn, this type of function, this type of function, this type of function with three different messages. And then whether some people will use engagement, some people will use like they'll use whatever signal to uh, orchestrate an outbound motion. And that's sort of like the um, most simplistic way to think about it. And so. So just different targeting within LinkedIn, essentially to get those executive titles. Yeah, it's yeah. Diff different targeting at the account level and then add the titles. And then in, if it makes sense and you understand each persona to, um, to have different messaging for different stakeholders that are going to be involved in the, in the process. If it truly is complex, if it's, if it's not that complex and you just need a single buyer and then the rest of the people he's, they're going to champion the sale. The rest of the people are going to get on board. Then just stick with your buyer. And so. So a secondary question that then kind of knowing more about the situation I'm in, you know, at this, at this stage, would you hire salespeople to kind of appease the, the, you know, the higher echelon, the board, or would you just keep going on the paid social trying to create that brand awareness so that when you actually hire the salespeople, they can, they can have an easier path? What, I mean, I don't, I don't think I have enough context to like give you that recommendation. Um, so I think that one is truly on your side. Um, let me try and put myself in your shoes. Megan tells me I'm not very good at this. Um, I think if I were you, I would start to carve off a percentage of my time where I would do what a salesperson would do. And then, I've been doing that, by the way. So I've been doing that. Yeah. And so if you've been doing it and you're not getting any further, then bringing in someone in that's more junior isn't going to get you any different result. It's, it's unlikely, right? And so um, that would be an indicator to me to, to not do it. Um, so you just continue to go with the paid social strategy to try to just continue to build that brand? Yeah. Or like, I, I imagine that you talk to a lot of people, but I think at, at this stage, maybe it begs the question of, are you, do you need to think about your targeting and your positioning, your segmentation and your differentiation and product, product market, market fit? fit. That yeah. really comes back down to that. It'd be great to have, uh, to know that you had product market fit, right? You yeah. can only get that by getting more and more customers that are in that target niche. Even like, us, that niche. even us, like it took us more than a year in, in our evolution of what we do to have true product market fit. And so some that stuff takes time. And while we were doing it, we were constantly changing the product. At the same time, the, the person that was buying it, the type of company, the segmentation part of it, that was changing too. And so both, both those different things were changing. We don't work with a lot of the companies that I started working with two years ago. Um, and so both those pieces evolved. And so perhaps it's a, a targeting perspective. Perhaps there's a product or messaging gap. Yeah, I know you, you typically work with larger organizations. What would you recommend with your, at, if you, I know you would say don't go there, but if you landed at a, an early stage pre-equity company with, um, you, know, and, you know, trying to launch something new and not necessarily certain that you have a product market fit, is there anything you would do from a marketing perspective for such an, at an, such an early stage that I'm not already yeah. doing. I've been in a company that's 800K ARR and has 14 employees and was trying to figure it out, right? So I've, I've been in your shoes before. What I did was I spun my wheels on the MQL hamster wheel for four months doing what they told me to do. And then when I realized how bad it wasn't working and, and heard, listened to the sales conversations, all the stuff that wasn't doing, and then called some of those leads myself. I took a step back and I said, I'm going to spend the next 30 days talking to people in all these different segments. And so that might be the place where you're at. 
And so it's not only about talking to customers, it's about talking to people that don't use and understanding what the alternative they use is. Is it, is it a direct competitor to you? But most often it's probably whatever the status quo is. Yeah. And so, and then you got to figure out where is this person and compared to where our customers are and what is the stuff in between and how do I fill that gap or can I even fill the gap? Got it. Okay. Thank you. Certainly appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to help. Yeah. And I'll bring Uma on next. You can ask your, and Bob, I think from what you've been describing and following your journey, like hiring a salesperson, I think would be putting a bandaid on it. I think you had, you made a comment that you might not quite be a product market fit. And I think that's the root cause. Uma, do you, hey. I know you probably Where you been, Uma? Italia. I've been good. I've you've been, been getting, good. you've been getting stuff done, huh? Good to see you I've back been here. Getting stuff done. And uh, Bob and I talked. We had wow. A Is that Hawaii? And Bob said, Hey, you got to come back to demand. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> And, and generally, this is the time when I have my one-on-one -on -one with my manager. And today I told her, I was like, I've got to go to Chris Walker today. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah. So, uh, of course, I've been following you guys on LinkedIn. So, here is where I am. So, I've got uh, joined the company. SEM was not there. Social was not there. Marketo was a mess. So, I've been fixing the infrastructure slowly, 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 building things up. Um, oil and gas industry with a brand new product, SaaS product. And we are trying to target a really small... Um, target account list. I have like 305 target account yeah. lists, very well flushed out, built yeah. out. Um, my that's not that problem, small, by the way. <laughs> that's, that's decent. I would call that medium size, but, but me, continue. Medium size, yeah, yes. Yeah. But, uh, but um, where I am right now, and I, 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 it could be that I'm just way too early in. Our product mm. just got launched January 12th and I'm too early in, but maybe I'm a little impatient. So I ran targeted LinkedIn ads did the native form paid tons of money didn't get anything quality so i stopped that when you say quality I, the, for free trials, so I've been, right? yeah yeah so i've been talking deeper with customers because quality comes in several forms right oh, okay. there's two two main forms that i see and i like to make this distinction now for people it's one the people are not firmographically able to buy your stuff that's one. The second one is they are firmographically able to buy your stuff and they have zero buying intent. And so on LinkedIn ads, typically you get the second one, you get people that firmographically fit because the targeting is great, but they don't actually want to buy your stuff. Which one was it for you? Um, I think the second one, you're right. Um, yeah. So they are the right target audience, but they don't want to buy because of the complexity of the product. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, we are trying to lure them away from a legacy software to a SaaS platform. So mm. there is a whole mindset also in an oil and gas industry where people are more old school. So changing the mindset, bringing them to a new platform. So all of that is there. Mm -hmm. So um, my Facebook ad I started got tons of crappy interaction. I had to shut that down. Yeah. Another and note for so people. The, Sorry. Another, I just want to, you're giving me a bunch of ideas that I haven't communicated to people. If you run Facebook ads, you are going to get, negative or spam comments. It's part of the game. I did. I it's, did. it's part of what happens at this point. So if you, uh, and some companies won't run Facebook ads because they get them. Um, you can't turn off comments. You can set up auto moderation. There are ways, but just know going into it that, that it's, it's not, it's not only for you. We experience it on, I would say more than 50% of the companies that we do work for. And we just manage it because the impact is great, but you will get that stuff. Oh, okay. So that's good to know because I, I panicked. I looked at the comments. I'm like, I don't want my CEO seeing those comments. So I, yeah. I shut it down. I was like, oh my God, it was like trashy comments. So, but uh, an but alternative for you, by the way, is you could run Instagram stories where people can't comment. So that's something to think about too. Of, but my, my issue with Instagram is that my target audience is not there. My yeah. target audience is IT in oil and gas industry. Facebook Product and engineers and all they're not on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're on Facebook or LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So my ad rules have been doing well. I just got a this is a plug also. I just got lead feeder that's giving me an insight into what kind of audience I'm bringing in. So that's helping me clean things up. Okay. My my issue is that I have and I do have a BDR that I am running the campaigns and I'm giving the um, the the so engagement metrics to my BDR and he's going through the list and is calling. Mm -hmm. What is working is that the BDR is able to get to the person, 
and connects to the CEO. CEO is the salesperson in our team and he's able to close and get people to sign up for a free trial. So that is happening. What I need is my win to say, this came through demand gen and CEO didn't have to. And, uh, and it's product just launched last month. So I still just one month in, but I've been doing the awareness since October. Is it, am I being too soon, being impatient? Do I just continue doing what I'm doing? Or is there something, some other magic trick that I should do um, to get interaction? Uh, I did just start today uh, segmenting my audience into two different personas and sent different messaging email to them. My Another issue is that leg, before the company was a little bit in a spammy behavior of email, so I am mm -hmm. landing more in spam filter than in the inbox. So I have the right audience, I have the messaging, how do I get out of that how much does the How much does the product cost and how what on a low, medium or high scale of terms of cost of switching, where do you fall? It actually is really good. It, the The legacy product can be somewhere around in like 250,000. This switch there, it's 50,000. It's like more than 50% savings. So, okay. so savings are there. And my ARR would be between 50,000 to 300,000 also people who have signed up because it, mm -hmm. you can have a small number of bells or you can have multiple number of bells. So, and the product suits the entire range of small and mid-sized companies. So far out of the 305, how many of those accounts have converted to a free trial based on what you're doing right now? So people have signed up for free trial and they are just beginning to start the free trial. So I have like okay. about 27 people who have, but 27 accounts. Five, other than five of them, four of them that came through that I can claim that it's a demand gen influence. Most of them have been just the BDR calling, getting the interview with the uh, CEO and the CEO of helping them sign up. Yeah, but you have 300, it's been a month mm -hmm. and you have 305 total targets mm -hmm. and 27%, 27 of them are on free trial, which is close to 10% of your target account list. Mm-hmm. So the next question I have, so one, like, that's good. The fact that you've done that is good. The next step is, are the free trials actually becoming customers? Because it's really easy to sign up for a free trial. It's way different to switch from your legacy tool and pay, shell out 300K for this new tool. So, so have any of the 27 converted to a paying user? They haven't, but at least two we see as most likely they will. Okay. Two. So one almost confirmed another one, most likely. I, I would make no changes to the strategy. I mean, you can do some of the things that we talk about here, but I wouldn't stop doing this. And I wouldn't think that it at this team size with you and this and the CEO selling deals, forget about who did it, right? Like it okay. doesn't matter whether it came from you or the BDR, you're just two people. Right. Okay. And so just forget about who did it and focus on getting more people into a free trial. <laughs> I do have to justify myself. It's like, I, I brought people in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, I wouldn't be caught up on that. But like, okay. um, to go from here and at those deal sizes that where I don't know where the business is at, but you like could get to a million ARR if you convert like four or five of those. Yeah. And so... Um, I would just, I would just keep moving down the track that you're doing and feel free to introduce other things that we've, we've talked about on the show, but, um, can you, the short answer is like, you're probably, you're eh, it's probably too soon and you're being impatient. And I find myself in that position. Sometimes every time I start a new customer, I always think it's going to work faster than it actually does. Right. So, so. continue doing the, um, LinkedIn tar matched audience campaign and, Facebook lookalike and ad role matched audience. With your 305 total accounts, I would not be running Facebook lookalikes. Okay. That, be that, because that, it's I too, told. it's the Facebook lookalike is going to build an audience that's 2.3 million people. Exactly. And you only need to go after probably five to 10 stakeholders at 300 accounts. So you're going after 3,000 people for give or take. And mm -hmm. you're targeting 2.3 million, which is just terribly inefficient. And so I would focus on, um, LinkedIn, and then see if you can get a different way to get to those people on Facebook. 
through a group or a, or a niche interest or something else than a lookalike. That, 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 that's a good one. Another thing that I'm exploring that I haven't done is to find the trade publications um, mm -hmm. that I haven't been able to find yet to say if I can do some ad placements um, or, or like, you know, post and LinkedIn groups. Mm -hmm. But I think you're, I mean, to launch the product last month and be here, I think you're in a good spot. Okay, that makes me feel good. Yeah, Thanks, yeah. Bob. Good thanks, to see, thanks, Good Bob. to see you. Enjoy the, yeah, the, you. the weather looks great over there. Yeah, I'm in California. <laughs> Good to see you, Uma. I'm glad your new job is working you. out. Um, all right, I've got Matthew and Amy. Matthew, I'm going to save you right after Amy. She had a good question, and I don't know if she's been on to ask. Um, hey, I see Rochelle on here. Rochelle, do you want to drop your question too? I know you sent me an email, but I haven't had a chance to get to it. So feel free to let Megan know in the chat if you want to. Hey, Amy, are you on? I think so. Hello. Hey, hey. What's up? Hey. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I've been doing a little bit of a deeper dive into the quality and quantity of the content that we are putting out. Um, I'm not a content writer. I'm a, a, probably a bit of a marketing generous, generalist specific title would be campaign manager. So I'm across all the things, looking at all the data and seeing where things are flowing in from where they're going. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to see, I'm kind of in the middle of the, uh, the, debate between quality versus quantity with content. Mm -hmm. um, trying to push our team to be striving towards a little bit more of the intent style data, intent style content. Um, I've seen the data that's so showing that um, a couple of content pieces that we've written a couple of years ago and not touched since then are still the ones with the biggest hits and the biggest um, return. Um, yet a lot of the content that seems to be just getting churned out over the past couple of months it's got like little to no visibility mm -hmm. um short of showing that engagement those engagement stats on linkedin are there any other suggestions on how i can kind of prove value or how we can kind of drive towards testing different things that could actually be well in my opinion a lot more valuable a lot more better yeah. used to when you're talking about this content, are you talking about mainly SEO? You mentioned LinkedIn engagement, which threw me off because it up to that point, I expected this would be SEO. Yeah, it is. You're right. It is mostly SEO. Um, so I've been tracking the visibility on the blogs on mm -hmm. the site. And also um, it's it's easier to also prove back to the business, the interaction and engagements of sharing that content on LinkedIn, for example. Yeah, so the it kind of goes into some of the stuff that we talked about before. Like it's hard to um, get a clear pulse about whether the audience is actually going to like the co SEO content because SEO content is tough to share on, on places with social where you can get more quick feedback. Um, and so on social, I'm just going to go there for people, maybe not for you, but I truly believe on social that a volume game is the right strategy because you quickly get better at making quality through doing more reps, quote unquote. The more that you do, you get better. Like I, our, our content production and a lot of the different things has gotten a lot better because I do it almost every day, right? And so for social, I wanna, maybe not recommendation for you, but for people that are listening afterwards is that dr driving volume at the beginning to accelerate learnings I think is very valuable and then continuing the volume because when I make seven podcasts in a week and other people that I'm competing with make seven in a year, I'm in five, in three to five years, I'm going to be significantly better than them. And it may be, and then that skill transfers to whatever else I want to do next. Maybe that becomes clubhouse. Maybe that becomes a different audio platform, but getting good at one, I think people have a weird relationship in content creation as well as the idea that like, if LinkedIn goes away that like, it like it's all over, right? Like that's not true. You built up a lot of skills. You built up a lot of brand equity that you take with you and then you continue to build on platforms over time. But it's the skill that is the thing that will have the most value long-term in terms of creating social content. Now it's 
now that we did that, let's talk about um, your question. So my suggestion would be to sort of use the model that I just presented. And so in order to learn faster about, about what people like, create different content for social where you know that there's an audience. If you have to use paid, then use paid to figure it out, targeted, or build an audience organically. And because you get feedback faster about what's actually working. Um, and then if it gets, and then as it resonates, then you could put together specifically a blog post that targets a keyword that you mentioned there inside of SEO, which is an interesting, I had never said it that way before, but it's an interesting approach. Another thing that we, we, ha we have thought about doing that just like, we just haven't done it yet is the idea that like every one of these episodes could theoretically become a very detailed blog post for search. Um, so you could start with a different content format and then move it into search potentially. Um, so those are a couple of ideas, but I think what you're missing here is the idea of what quality is and you're measuring quality based on clicks or results, not necessarily like qualitative feedback of what people think about it. And so using social will give you that real feedback about whether or not they like it through comments or engagement, um, which then will give you more insight to, to put it back into like a SEO strategy. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to have you on, Amy. All right. We've got our chat host, DGL loyalist, Matthew. Come on on. And then uh, I'll bring on Rochelle after. Cool. Eric bowing at me. Eric, over not bowing at me, man. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, you're um, famous. You're okay. DGL famous. <laughs> really? All right. So this isn't a question for me as, as much as it is from Refern Labs. Um, <laughs> But uh, how do you how do you approach breaking up with a customer? What do you what are the things you're trying to maintain or not during that process? And I'm specifically asking Megan that question. Yeah, I uh, I can I have a formula for this. I can break it down for you, um, and then you can decide or not. But I think you also had like a warm take on podcasting that could be fun for you to to share after. Oh sure, I'd be happy to. <laughs> I'm I'm missing my warm takes. I was trying to get the segment yeah. up and running. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think, um, I mean, customer churn happens all the time and people don't really talk about it, but, um, I mean, I've been in customer success for 15 years and I have, you know, I've had to initiate a breakup with a customer, um, a lot, um, it happens. And so I think for me, I have sort of my formula down, um, because it's awkward, like any dissolution of a relationship is when you initiate that conversation. But I think first it's making sure that, um, before you broach the topic with the customer, that there's really no salvaging the situation. They're either not the best fit for you or something happened. And so you just have to quickly evaluate and gut check to make sure that you want to take that course of action. As soon as you do, you need to then figure out who the primary decision maker is or who the right person to have that conversation is with. It needs to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one person not brought up in a, in a, in a group meeting. Um, and then you kind of got to cut to the chase. Um, so you don't want to dance around it. You got to be direct. You got to explain sort of your perspective that you don't think that the partnership is a good fit, avoid blame. Um, I mean, it's a little bit of like, it's not you, it's me, but like, you want to make it, you want to make it amicable and you don't want to burn a bridge. And so you want to position it as something has changed. Um, or, you know, in working together, we've realized that we're not going to be able to help you hit your goals. And I don't want to keep taking your money if you're not going to get the desired outcome that you're looking for. So frame it up as it, this is the best sort of decision for both sides. Um, and then the key is making sure that you support a really smooth transition and that you leave the door open for the future because just because this particular customer, this particular company isn't a good fit now, they could get a different job, something could change. And so you want to break up in a way that you leave on good terms. Um, you know, the best ones are willing to still be a reference for you. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, in some situations, they can, they can place blame or they get defensive. And so you have to be careful in trying not to get into a blame game, trying not to rehash the past, because that's when things can kind of end uh, very awkwardly. And then it's really hard to recover the relationship from there. Um, 
And then making sure that you follow through after that conversation and make the transition as smooth as possible so that they, they end on a, on a good note. Those are some of the key things that are important to keep in mind for that. Do you ever leave behind like, look, I know we're not going to work with each other anymore, but you should be looking at doing this going forward, or this stuff is going to hold you back. If you don't, if you don't consider changing a position or an approach, how do you kind of leave it at that point? Do you, do you get that honest with them? Or is it like, no, I'll just clean break, kind of keep that, kind of keep that underlying feeling to myself and just, you know, let, uh, let discretion be the better part of valor there. Yeah. I mean, I've been in situations where I've actually recommended that they use a competitor. Um, so sometimes it's like, you know what, we're not a good fit because of X, Y, and Z, but this competitor, like they literally will give you what you want. So consider them because they might actually be a good fit at this time. So I think if you have a recommendation for a path forward, you should definitely recommend that. Um, you, you can bring up other recommendations and things for them to consider only if you can constructively provide a solution. I think what you want to avoid is them feeling like you're piling on and, and attacking them. So I would say, um, be strategic about the things that you choose um, and bring it up and having like some type of constructive recommendation of a path forward is the way to think about that. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question, Matthew. Ooh, you want to share, you want to share your podcasting warm oh, take? Sure. Um, so recently I switched my podcast format up. I basically, um, MJ is my podcast partner who um, is a refined customer just for full transparency sake, but I um, love MJ. <laughs> everyone loves MJ. MJ is <laughs> the most popular person in manufacturing marketing. But, um, <laughs> but that said, like we felt um, the, the guest interview was getting kind of stale. And we also just noticed we didn't, weren't bringing as much energy to it. And so we decided to switch the format up and started to go after dissecting marketing examples in our little niche in the industrial niche. So we started going, finding content pieces or, or website examples or campaigns we're seeing on Facebook and basically just started to dissect them and kind of give our twist or our opinion on it. And then we would also segue into people who we follow on LinkedIn who are posting interesting stuff. And essentially what I do when I promote it is I just tag that person in the post and just say, look, we talked about what this person talked about and how we thought it was interesting. And it basically becomes a warm intro to get them on the podcast if I really want to interview them. I've done that now three times and I've had all three people come to me and say they're interested in coming on the show to expand on that more. I got a guy from Johnson and Johnson who's going to come on the podcast tomorrow to talk about it. He's got a clubhouse group with 35,000 members. And I was like, well, how's this guy got a 35,000 member med tech clubhouse group? And so I was like, so we just talked about like, what is this guy doing? Mm -hmm. And I never met him before. I just, we just, I just tagged him in the, in the post and then he reached out and I made a interview happen in a day out of that, mm -hmm. even though, and if I cold message him to try to get him on the podcast, I highly doubt he would have ever <laughs> responded to me. So I, uh, I partially credit just taking the initiative and just kind of discussing him and then including him in the, and on the content. So what's the, what's the warm take? That's, that's just my warm take. That's just that's what I've been by tearing down someone's stuff, tearing down, being a, oh, in a good, I being in a, you know, in, a, in a good way, just like, a, like, talking about something that he did and talking about the stuff, right? Tearing down was not the right word, but talking about that and then posting a podcast and tagging them. And so I think you should try this um, just as a little AB test. I think that the next two or three guests that you want to do this for, that you just message them and say, Hey, love your stuff about, I love read this thing about X, Y, and Z. It would be great. We'd love to have you on the show. I my gut and my experience tells me that they would say yes anyway. But if you enjoy doing the content, that's great. Like it's a play on Patrick Campbell does pricing page teardown, just looks at pricing pages and evaluates them. And they do a video podcast on that. And so it's a good strategy. Okay. So um, I do have a use case on that. Cause one of the people who I did call out in the podcast, I did reach out to her several times and she never responded to me. And then I went ahead and her company did this really cool virtual event it was basically a tv show and it was awesome like it was probably one of the better virtual events i've seen played they ran a promo video on it on linkedin mm -hmm. it got fifty thousand views it did super well and so we talked about it as a as a topic on the podcast and then i tagged her and then her ceo followed me and listened to the podcast and shared it on the company page and then and then she reached out and expressed interest in being on the podcast and after trying to reach out to her prior in a cold outreach as you mentioned and getting nothing. It's one example. I'm sure I need to give it 
more tries than that, but that was one qualitative yeah. example where I got I, that kind of sold me on the idea of, of trying that uh, trying that approach. I think it's really good that you and MJ are just talking as hosts too, because I've I, an interesting piece of feedback that I've, I've gotten or I've, I've seen from other people is when you have guests on, you maybe don't talk as much. And so yeah, people want to hear that. what you have to say, what MJ has mm-hmm. to say. Um, and I think it's cool that you can mix it up, right? You can have, you can still have your guests and you can have some where it's just you, you both talking. And I think having the variety is also like part two of the warm take. Yeah. yeah it's, been, it's been good to switch that up. So go ahead, Chris. The, the variety is great. The way that we do it, like Udi talked basically the whole time and I was definitely cool with it. Right. And so, but then there's other ones where I talk the whole time. And so I think Bill, what what I think that we do differently than most podcasts is put together a lot of different formats, which I think keeps it interesting for people. There's Q and a, there's guests, there's talking, there's events, there's different stuff. And most of the time it's just like, when we pick someone else that we're going to interview and then we're going to interview them. And the only reason that we're going to interview them is so either we can leverage their audience to try and get a couple more subscribers or so that we can try and sell to them later. Well, you did do one format that I thought was super interesting. It was the one you did over the weekend where you basically had a console, a consultation call and recorded it and then threw it up on your podcast. Yeah. We've been doing that a couple of times. It's uh, like, it's, it's the only way they're the people that we're doing that with would never become our customer, but I want to help them. And so the trade is let me record it and we'll put it on our podcast and I'm happy to do a free consulting call with you. Yeah. It's it's a good trade. Yeah. Yeah. So I've actually, I've lobbed that to my own founder for doing that for, for people who, cause we have plenty of, of customers or put to, uh, clients who are not good fits cause they don't have enough revenue mm-hmm. to afford what we do, but we still like to talk to them and just, and just keep in contact with them in case they grow. Um, and it's, it's a really good, uh, um, frankly format to, to try it. And so yeah. I think we're going to try it. Cool. Cool. Matthew, always good to good have to see you, you on. Always. Thanks for keeping the warm take segment alive. Rochelle, Rochelle, I'm going to bring you on next. Around. I know. Um, hey, hey, welcome. Hey, hey. Hey, thanks. Really, really appreciate your content. It's it's part of my uh, running routine, listening to this in the morning. Wow. Yeah, I know. But I I, I love it. I actually <laughs> listen to it and then come back and, re- and re-listen again so I can take my notes. <laughs> um, two questions. And I think one will probably, there was a lot going in the chat. So my first question is on content strategy and my second's on podcasts. So I work for a PE backed marketing services firm that where I have basically spent, I'm the vice president of marketing and spent the last 16 months of my life um, doing a massive undertaking of integrations and acquisitions. All we've been doing is buying small companies and integrating. So we're now at this, and so we've done no marketing. We've done mm-hmm. zero marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, so now we're at this point where we're launching a brand and, and we're going to start doing marketing. And what I, what I, I guess what I want to ask the group or, or ask you guys is I'm in this situation where we have a very small marketing team because our CEO doesn't really understand marketing and doesn't have the confidence in it. And so we have a very small team and no budget. This seems, sorry to interrupt you, but this seems really backwards. I know, I know. You, you sell marketing services yes. and the CEO yes. doesn't believe in marketing. There's a problem there. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> and I get that. And that I'm almost, ha- that's why I'm talking about it. It's but, sort of funny. So here, here's the challenge. I'm in B2B and this is like, uh, best way to describe it is the, the, the coming from the good old boys kind of network where I've worked at companies like, like this. I understand. We, yeah. The only way we get business is going to events and don't, you know, and so now in COVID, obviously that's all gone. And so we're, our sales dropped a ton. So content, I'm responsible for creating content. I'm not a strategy. I'm not a sector strategist. Mm-hmm. I we have seven vertical markets. Um, I was able to start doing customer interviews and I've been trying to tell people like, this is giving us second and third level insights that you can't possibly understand how much more valuable the content's going to be. However, that takes so much time that these other six segments, I'm literally wondering, am I just going to phone this in because I'm writing this and I'm not the expert and it's like, they want eBooks, they want blogs. How are you, how do people do this when you're like, Hey, I got one, one or two experts per vertical. The salespeople are a bit clueless. And so now it's me. Am I writing content in, in verticals that really are not my background? Mm. 
I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I guess I'm looking for how have people done that? Because we are a small, I mean, we've bought companies, but we're still yeah. re really small. Who wants you to make the eBooks? Sales. Sales. Yeah, yeah. 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 So the, the number one place not to be as a marketer is a place where you're taking orders from sales, especially for stuff like content. Um, unless it's enablement content and enablement falls under marketing. That's the one caveat, but I don't find an ebook to be enablement. Um, and so there's, I'm going to go in a couple of different directions and we're going to have a back and forth on this because this is a complex situation. Um, so we talk a lot about the, uh, and Udi brought it up to, I don't know if you were on that no. today. We talked to CMO of Gong. Uh, we had it on a live today and we, we, with really smart marketing people that have great alignment with their CMO, this topic always comes up. And he said it exactly, this is exactly what he said today, is that if there's a CEO that you work for that doesn't believe in marketing, you will not change their mind. Yeah. Um, and I believe that. I've worked in plenty of companies and I, I believe that to be true. Um, and so that's something to consider. Um, and so if you acknowledge, like, let's just go down the path. I don't know where we'll end up, but let's just go down the path. If we acknowledge that we're not going to change their mind about this, then we're going to be continuously just doing whatever the sales team wants. And I've been in this position before too, in 2015, 2016, they told me to, to do a webinar and they needed this and they wanted training and they wanted me to go to their big customer meeting because they didn't understand the messaging for that segment or whatever. Like, and I just did whatever they told me to do. And then, and then three months in, I was like, all the stuff that I've been doing hasn't driven any business. Maybe I should do something else. Um, and then I figured out things that actually drive business. And so, but the gap of figuring out what things actually drive business took six to 12 months. And so I think you're in a sort of a weird, a tough position. So here's some ideas. Um, one idea, how many people are on your team? We have, <laughs> we have four total people in marketing. One is completely doing sales uh, marketing ops. Yep. So handling our, you know, our Salesforce system and everything like that. And so it's me and one other person. And then our CMO who's a hundred percent aligned with me, like all the time, it's just, he's playing chess on everything. Like, what are we going to live and die on? Is it this yeah. one? That? So, so yeah, mm. I, I'm use. I have the ability to use an outside agency, but to be honest, Chris, the agency's not going to help me if I can't give them the outline of the content for them to expand upon. And it's like this vicious circle of, okay, I've got experts, no disrespect, they're salespeople. They've been doing this so long. They have a bias. They don't really talk to their customers about strategy. So yeah. I can't go and say that to them. And they're not going to fire all the salespeople. So of yeah, course but, not. You know. Yeah. And then, and I wouldn't expect anyone to do that. So here's an idea. I think you, uh, uh, there's more than two paths, but I'm going to give you two paths. One path is that whether it's internal or external, you find a company to do that stuff so that you can actually do real marketing Okay. and just eat that expense to get that stuff out of your face. I think that's a good first step. Right. And then if you can have someone on your team, the other person on your team, manage that and work through it so that you can think about strategy, because I know that there are seven verticals, but you're with four people and two of them not doing any real marketing, you're not going to be able to hit seven verticals at all. Well, right. Right. And so it's, where is the one, like we stay very focused on, we have customer people that come into us in a ton of different industries that we don't work with. Right. And, but they, st they come to us because we execute so well for SaaS. And so just pick one. And when you pick one and do it well, often people from other ones will notice and come through anyway. So I would put, if you do, or you're able to find an agency and you're able to free up space, then I would focus on the one that you think you have either the most differentiation, the best value prop, or the, the unfair competitive advantage. I'm, it's a weird, I've been, I've been talking, I, I wasn't thinking about talking about that, but I've been talking about it a lot on this episode is the idea that if you're trying to build a real business, you need to figure out what that is um, because over time, like I, I do feel right now amongst the people that we compete with, that we have a clear unfair competitive advantage and it's a, it's a great place to be in. And I've been in places where you definitely, where I have been marketing products where I definitely don't feel that way. Um, and so that's something to think about. And then 
the second path, and I, I like putting it out, it's not fun to say, but I like putting it out there, um, is the idea that you acknowledge that you're not going to change this person's mind and it's not a good place for you to be and you decide to go and find somewhere else. And the next time you do it, you vet whether or not the CEO gets marketing before you're on your way in, not while you're there. 100%. In fact, I'm, I'm already in my mind there. I want to get through this brand launch because it was so much a part of my life and what yeah. I've done that I'm not, you know, like I want to wait till we launch the new brand and it's live, but 100% path number two is, is going to happen. It's just a matter, just a matter of, of time. Yeah, right, right. Um, but, but honestly, like um, uh, when I say that sometimes, like I think that people either listening or on here might think that it's a bad thing. Like I've gotten comments, like why are you telling people to leave? It's because long-term, it's going to drive, uh, it's going to slow down your career. It's going to drive unhappiness. It's going to have you on this Zoom talking about things that are frustrating, where if you just went to someone else, you'd be able to do everything that you want to do. Right. right. Yeah. Um, and then my second question about, it's, it's along the same lines. So how do you guys, besides stats, because I have got stats for days, are you saying anything specific in your strategy when you have senior leadership who says, I'm really not seeing the podcast, Rochelle. Like I, I'm literally starting a podcast for our company. I, I've, I've put together a, a calendar interviews and they're like, you know, I'll go with you on this one, but I just don't see it in B2B. Besides saying, have you lost your effing mind? Is there something someone is like, you know what? Again, what's the strategy? I mean, how can, I don't, I don't know if they're living under a rock yeah, you know, I don't know what to say to that. It seems so like I almost feel like I'm I'm on some sort of live video when they're saying this to me. And, and <laughs> it's, it's going to be someone's yeah. going to pop out and be like surprised. Yes. <laughs> um, no, so so I'll go through an an example of when this happened. So um, I was working for a company. I was inside of the ICU one night, and I saw all the people that I would wanted to market to and what they were doing on their breaks when they were on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Like the profile of this person is a typically a 25 to 60 year old majority are female. And so nurses and, and respiratory therapists and things like that. So that was the demo and that's what they were doing. And it was very clear to me. It made sense. It was like, okay, when, right when I saw that, I was like, we're going to figure out when they're doing this at two in the morning, how we're there and how we're in there for something that they want to see. And I went back to HQ coming from the ICU in Atlanta and going back to the HQ. And I'm like, all right, got this plan. We're going to run Facebook ads. And I got laughed out of the room. We were in the, like, people were laughing at me about running Facebook ads in, to try and sell medical tech, expensive medical technology into hospitals in 2016. And so what I did was I knew it was true and I created a survey. So I created a survey and I had like nine or 10 different questions. And one of them is, do you, do you listen or do you use social media? Which platforms? do you use social media to research medical technology? And then I looked at the, and then which platforms do you use? Rank them in this order in terms of when you're researching a medical technology, where will you go? When do you buy? What do you look at? And I just pulled the data and I was like, look, 60% of the people we're going after respiratory directors. I surveyed 600 of them, 56% said they use Facebook to learn about this stuff. That's good. And that was enough, but it's a, it's a lot of work to prove a point that's obvious. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to help. <laughs> Thanks, Rochelle. Great questions. It's good to have you on the show. That was good. But, oh man. I feel like we're like nearing the end of our double uh, feature today. Trust me. I am more than ready. If people want to <laughs> shut this down. <laughs> Closing <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is probably the, the, most extended period of time that I've ever done a live for. I'm actually surprised that I'm like not losing my mind right now. It's probably been four hours of, of zoom LinkedIn lives. People use zooms all the time, but this is actually live stuff. So um, appreciate all of you coming. It's always, it's always fun. Um, love that you all stay here and had some of the conversations that we have are awesome. And so I'm not sure what's going to happen because we have two key episodes that both got recorded today. So I'm really curious which one's going to launch tomorrow and which one will launch otherwise. Or maybe we'll just do them both. I don't know. Stay tuned for that. We'll decide tomorrow. And uh, it's great to see you and can't wait to see you again next week. Have a great week, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you next Tuesday.